As the conflict in Ukraine continues, which is essentially a proxy war between the United States and Russia, we have to keep in mind that the United States is maneuvering itself and its so-called allies into position for a very similar conflict with China in Asia Pacific. Recently, I wrote an article titled Washington's True Fear of China, an Obstacle to American Hegemony. In this article, I try to explain the real motivation behind the United States and what it is doing in the Asia Pacific region. We always hear the United States depict China as some sort of imminent threat to global peace, stability, prosperity, and security, when in reality it is the U.S. that is the, the greatest danger to global peace and stability. The United States is not afraid that China is going to become a global spanning abusive superpower. They're worried that China is going to create an international order that inhibits the United States from continuing to be a, a global spanning abusive superpower. Uh, so let me read through this article and I will stop and add a, additional context when I feel is necessary and I will begin reading it now. A recent op-ed appearing in Foreign Affairs titled The Taiwan Catastrophe, that is this one right here. Uh, the Taiwan Catastrophe, what America and the world would lose if China took the island. Let me, I will explain in great detail why Taiwan is already part of China, indisputably, even according to the United States government itself. And so already we can see the narrative doesn't add up. And this narrative uh, spelled out in this op-ed reflects a sentiment widely held across Washington, in London, and also in Brussels. So a recent op-ed appearing in Foreign Affairs titled The Taiwan Catastrophe helped paint a clear picture of U.S. motivations behind its growing confrontation with China and the increasingly unrealistic nature of Washington's desired outcome, which is the successful containment of China to maintain American primacy over the entire globe and prevent China from displacing it as the uh, strongest economy, strongest military, strongest political and diplomatic power on Earth. The premise of the op-ed is built on a now declassified top secret memo by U.S. General Douglas MacArthur in 1950 describing Taiwan as an unsinkable aircraft carrier, essential not to protect the continental United States, but to preserve U.S. primacy over Asia Pacific thousands of miles from U.S. shores. So that is actually found here on the State Department's official website under the Office of the Historian. There's actually uh, at least two memos on this page. You have to scroll down to get to this one dated June 1950, Memorandum on Formosa, because at that time Taiwan was called Formosa by General of the Army Douglas MacArthur, Commander-in-Chief, Far East Supreme Commander, Allied Powers, Japan. This is what he wrote, and this is what I will be referring to in my article. The front line of the Far East Command, as well as the Western Strategic Frontier of the United States, rests today on the littoral islands extending from the Aleutians through the Philippine archipelago. Geographically and strategically, Formosa, now known as Taiwan, is an integral part of this offshore position, which in the event of hostilities can exercise a decisive degree of control of military operations along the periphery of Eastern Asia. So it's all about controlling Asia. It has nothing to do with promoting democracy, uh, maintaining peace and stability. It's about controlling the region. And he explains how. In the event of a war, United States striking forces based on this line would have the capability to interdict the limited means of communication available to the communists and deny or materially reduce the ability of the USSR to exploit the natural resources of East and Southeast Asia. This essential capability on the part of the United States is dependent to a large degree upon the retention of Formosa or Taiwan by a friendly or a neutral power or a client regime that the United States completely controls, as is the case right now. So this is what I'm referring to in my article when I reference this memo. By retaining Taiwan and the U.S. military presence it was a part of, which included and still includes Japan and the Philippines, General MacArthur noted U.S. forces 
could interdict the ability of regional powers, at that time the Soviet Union, now clearly China, uh, their ability to exploit the natural resources of East and Southeast Asia. The ability to contain China this enables remains Washington's primary motivation to this day for maintaining a U.S. military presence across East and Southeast Asia. So if you look at a map and you look at where the U.S. military is located, you can see that they are creating a military presence that could, if the United States wanted, cut uh, Chinese maritime shipping, strangle its economy. And I'll get, into, I'll get into that in more detail here in just a moment. Next, I talk about how this is all about containing China. It has nothing to do with defending the United States. The U.S. National Defense Strategy, that is this document right here, the links to all of this will be in the video description below. This is dated October 2022, and specifically this part here on page 37 of the PDF uh, of the document. Promote a free and open Indo-Pacific. Build shared regional support for open access to the South China Sea. We always hear that the United States has to have a military presence in and around the South China Sea. Otherwise, China is going to disrupt the freedom of navigation through those waters. Uh, but as I will explain here in just a moment, that does not add up. It's exactly the opposite, as a matter of fact. The U.S. National Defense Strategy designates out-competing China as Washington's top priority. The U.S. National Defense Strategy complains that China harbors the intention and increasingly the capacity to reshape the international order in favor of one that tilts the global playing field to its benefit. The U.S. National Defense Strategy never mentions the international order China seeks to displace as one that had previously occupied Chinese territory before the world wars, stationed thousands of troops on the shores of its island province of Taiwan until 1979, and continues to place U.S. troops on Taiwan despite recognizing the island province as Chinese territory from 1979 onward under Washington's own One China policy. Now here's where I'm going to stop and explain Washington's One China policy in, in, in depth. I do this every time I bring up this topic. I apologize to people who regularly follow my work and understand this concept by now, but there is still a, a very vast misunderstanding across Western audiences or anyone exposed to Western narratives regarding the status of Taiwan. People believe that it's an independent country that China is bullying and that the United States is protecting. But as I'm going to demonstrate here, uh, referencing the U.S. State Department's own official website and United States government documents, the United States knows Taiwan is part of China, is playing a very dangerous double game that if any other nation played with the United States, it would be perceived as an act of war. If you go to the State Department's official website on their fact sheet titled U.S. Relations with Taiwan, it will say the United States approach to Taiwan has remained consistent across decades and administrations. The United States has a long-standing one China policy, which is guided by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three U.S.-China joint communiques, and the six assurances. Now, what does all of this mean? Uh, the Taiwan Relations Act was unilaterally passed by the U.S. government with no input at all from the Chinese government. And uh, the six assurances were made, again, in contradiction to the U.S.-China joint communiques, which were the only uh, interaction between the U.S. government and China in regard to the status of Taiwan. This same web page on the State Department's official website talks about the American Institute in Taiwan is a non-governmental organization mandated by the Taiwan Relations Act uh, to carry out the United States' unofficial relations with Taiwan. Unofficial relations because Taiwan is not a country. It's not recognized as a country by the U.S. State Department. Therefore, there is no U.S. embassy in Taiwan. There is the American Institute in Taiwan is a de facto embassy because it's not a country. There is no real embassy. The only embassy the United States has in China is on the mainland. 
This same document, if you scroll down, explicitly says, we do not support Taiwan independence. As, 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 as explicit as can be, they do not recognize Taiwan as any sort of independent country. So that is what the US State Department officially states on its own website. That is the official US position regarding the status of Taiwan. And yet the actions of the US government in relation to the in, in relation to Taiwan completely contradict its official position on Taiwan, which is the sole sole source of these tensions over Taiwan. Now, I talked about the Taiwan Relations Act and this, the six assurances and how this has nothing to do with China. I also talked about the joint communiques. You can find these online. This is uh, one of the communiques dated 1972. This is the United States government and China sitting down talking about various aspects of US Chinese relations and Taiwan is specifically mentioned. And this is what this communique says. The US side declared the United States acknowledges that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there is but one China and that Taiwan is a part of China. The United States government does not challenge that position. It reaffirms its interest in a peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves. With this prospect in mind, it affirms the ultimate objective of the withdrawal of all U.S. forces and military installations from Taiwan. Because before 1979, there were thousands of U.S. troops stationed on the island province of Taiwan. In the meantime, it will progressively reduce its forces and military installations on Taiwan as the tensions in the area dim diminish. Let me repeat that again. The United States acknowledges that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there is but one China and that Taiwan is a part of China. The United States government does not challenge that position. Now, what many try to do regarding the statement is claim that the government in Taipei is the sole legitimate government of all of China. But I think we can all agree that that is utterly absurd. But what many people don't know is that there, there is no country called Taiwan. There is no entity called Taiwan. The government in Taipei officially refers to itself as the Republic of China. In the constitution, it refers to the Republic of China. What a one China policy lays out is that there is only one China. Taiwan is part of China. There's only one legitimate government of all of China, and that is the People's Republic of China based in Beijing. That is what the United States agreed to. That is what the United Kingdom, Australia, the rest of the European Union, and virtually every other country on Earth. There's a very, very short and shrinking list of nations, often coerced by the US, uh, to claim that the Republic of China is the sole legitimate government of all of China. And these countries are not allowed to do any sort of business with the rest of China until they agree to a one China policy. So I hope that makes it clear because the Western media will never explain that to you. Every single article you read in the Western media about Taiwan deliberately omits all of this information and the way they word uh, any reference to Taiwan, they word it to infer, but they never clearly state they infer that somehow taiwan is an independent country that china is bullying it and that the united states is protecting it but now you know the rest of the story now in my article i also talked about u.s troops based on taiwan currently you saw in the joint communique the u.s said they would withdraw all of their troops here is from the wall street journal this is 2023 just last year U.S. to expand troop presence in Taiwan for training against China threat. The Pentagon is helping Taiwan focus on tactics and weapon systems that would make the island harder to assault. And why would China assault its own territory? Because the United States is encouraging separatism within Chinese territory. 
And this is what the article says. The U.S. is marketedly increasing the number of troops deployed to Taiwan, more than quadrupling the current number to bolster a training program for the island's military amid a rising threat from China. The U.S. plans to deploy between 100 and 200 troops to the island in the coming months, up from roughly 30 there a year ago, according to U.S. officials. The larger force will expand a training program the Pentagon has taken pains not to publicize as the U.S. works to provide Taipei with the capabilities it needs to defend itself without provoking Beijing. Why would they be provoking Beijing? Because the U.S. officially recognizes Taiwan as Chinese territory, and yet they are openly, deliberately, and... Uh, in every way possible, undermining Chinese sovereignty over ta ta uh, Taiwan. Now, getting back to my article, let me continue with the article. The same U.S. national defense strategy claims the U.S. seeks to promote a free and open Indo-Pacific, and more specifically, open access to the South China Sea. The report even points out that Nearly two-thirds of global maritime trade and a quarter of all global trade pass through the South China Sea, all while implying China threatens this trade. And this is a another misconception people have is that there's all of this trade going through the South China Sea and the, the Chinese are building up their military in the South China Sea to somehow disrupt that. Why, why is that uh, utterly ridiculous? My article will explain that. However, the U.S. government and U.S. corporations, including from across America's arms industry, fund foreign policy think tanks like the Center for Strategic and International Studies, also known as CSIS, which publish analysis like a 2017 report titled, How Much Trade Transits the South China Sea? That is right here. And I have covered this many times before, and if you scroll down, there are a lot of visual aids helping explain this. Uh, as you can see, this giant dot, that represents Chinese trade going through the South China Sea. You can see all of these other nations who primarily trade with China. And you see the United States and Europe, the rest of the world, not as much. And what little is going through the South China Sea is most likely trade with China itself. This report admits the vast majority of trade passing through the South China Sea comes from and is going to China. The report even admits, this is a quote, China's reliance on the South China Sea leaves it vulnerable to maritime trade disruptions. In 2003, then President Hu Jintao drew attention to the potential threat posed by certain major powers. I wonder who those certain major powers could possibly be. Uh, aiming to control the Strait of Malacca and highlighted the need for China to adopt new strategies to address this concern. Clearly, China has no intention of disrupting its own trade in the South China Sea. In reality, just as U.S. General MacArthur pointed out in 1950, the U.S. military presence in the region today is there not to protect maritime trade, but specifically to interdict it. Now let's talk about this idea of defending democracy and what they really mean when you hear U.S. policymakers, politicians, commentators, uh, so-called journalists making this claim that the U.S. is defending democracy on Taiwan. What, what are they actually talking about? The article continues, just as the U.S. creates the illusion of protecting maritime trade as a smokescreen for in fact preparing specifically to interdict it, the U.S. also uses other smokescreens to justify its continuous interference within and along China's borders. This includes the island province of Taiwan itself. The foreign affairs op-ed claims that the U.S. is defending democracy, yet the political administration on Taiwan and the policies it implements are not the product of democratic self-determination, but instead are determined on the other side of the planet in Washington. Policies like provoking Beijing, hindering trade between Taiwan and the rest of China, and channeling public funds into US weapons instead of economic development and infrastructure all demonstrably serve US interests explicitly at the expense of the local population's own best interests. 
The U.S. seeks to maintain its presence in the Asia Pacific, not to defend a process of self-determination in places like Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, or the Philippines, but instead to maintain America's political capture and control over each. Then the foreign affairs op-ed talks about semiconductors. So I address this in my article. The authors of the foreign affairs op-ed, perhaps suspecting their defending democracy narrative would be unconvincing, also claimed that the US must prevent China from controlling the semiconductor industry in Taiwan. The premise, upon stripping away the author's political rhetoric, lays out the bare bones of imperialism. A resource is important to the US, thus the US must control it, even if it is thousands of miles beyond its own shores. The arguments and planning by the US regarding the control of semiconductor production globally is fundamentally flawed. While Taiwan and the collective West hold many advantages over China in terms of semiconductor research development and manufacturing today, these advantages are based on historical factors that are no longer relevant. Today, the largest industrial base on Earth is located in China, not the United States. At one, at one point, it had been in the United States. China, not the United States, produces by far more graduates in fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, all relevant to advancing all stages of semiconductor production. And this applies to any other field of technology and manufacturing as well. And I regularly refer to this Forbes article. This is from 2016. Uh, I, I highly doubt that it has changed much since, probably more so in favor of China. And you can see here the number of STEM graduates, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, 4.7 million each year, the United States 568,000. Look at Russia with uh, less than half the population in the US has a comparable number of STEM graduates. Imagine that. Controlling Taiwan and imposing strict sanctions and export controls not only will fail to prevent China from assuming leadership in semiconductor production, it'll spur China to make the investments necessary to do it sooner and more decisively. And we can see, not just in regards to semiconductors uh, developed and manufactured in China and their ability to acquire this technology, surpass this technology on their own, despite US efforts to, to prevent this from happening, we can see the same process taking place in regards to US sanctions and restrictions, trying to inhibit the technological development of all, all other nations uh, around the globe, especially nations like Iran, Russia, and of course, China, especially in terms of semiconductors. I would say that the foreign affairs op-ed is not very convincing, and neither is the, the argument the US makes that, that this op-ed is a reflection of in terms of why the US needs to maintain a military presence in Asia Pacific, so far from America's own shores. Uh, but this, this next part of my article uh, talks about ensuring American access to and control over the Asia Pacific, because that is what this is all really about. So let me continue with this article. While the foreign affairs op-ed briefly attempts to convince readers that Taiwan's full reunification with the rest of China would trigger a chain reaction of Chinese conquests across the region, it abruptly shifts to fears of Beijing having the power to, quote, complicate U.S. access to East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Indian Ocean, the literal of the most populous, economically active part of the world, end quote. Just as with Taiwan's semiconductor industry, because the Indo-Pacific is the most populous and economically active part of the world, the U.S. must, for some reason, have access to it. Part of a wider sense of American entitlement to do what Washington wants anywhere it wants, regardless of how far from U.S. shores it may be, or how it impacts the peace, stability, sovereignty, and independence of all others involved. American exceptionalism. Another fear expressed in the op-ed stemmed from the prospect of Asia reducing its reliance on the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. The op-ed never explains why Asia's best interests are served by maintaining a reserve currency controlled by interests on the other side of the planet. And it, it honestly is as if policymakers in Washington have never looked at a 
a map of the planet Earth that they live on. They don't understand how absurd it is for the U.S. to see itself as entitled to so much power and influence over a region of the planet located literally on the opposite side of the globe. So next, I start digging into the true fears motivating the United States, this fear of China as an obstacle to U.S. primacy. The op-ed then surprisingly cites the United States itself as an example of why readers should fear the rise of China. This is what the the op-ed actually says. The, the foreign affairs op-ed actually says this. America's own history shows how achieving regional, regional preeminence facilitates global power projection. Only by dominating the Western hemisphere in the 19th century was the United States able to become a global superpower in the 20th. Then, with little self-awareness, the op-ed claims, it is impossible to predict precisely how China might act as a global power, but decades of data suggest it would take a far less benign approach than the United States. The authors claim this data includes China's presence in the South China Sea and a general massive military buildup. The authors never explain how these two examples represent an approach less benign than American foreign policy. In the 21st century alone, the U.S. invaded and occupied Afghanistan in 2001 and Iraq in 2003. The latter resulted in over a million deaths predicated on deliberate fabrications regarding Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. In 2011, the U.S. intervened militarily in Libya to overthrow the government in Tripoli. In 2014, the U.S. invaded Syria, occupying the nation's source of energy and food. In the words of then U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, Dana Stroll, this was done as leverage for affecting the overall political process for the broader Syrian conflict and as a means of withholding the reconstruction of Syria, admitting the U.S.-sponsored conflict transformed much of the country into rubble. The United States still had compelling forms of leverage on the table to shape an outcome that was more conducive and protective of U.S. interests. And we identified four. So the first one was the one-third of Syrian territory that was owned via the U.S. military with its local partner, the Syrian Democratic Forces. Now, this was a light footprint on the U.S. military, only about 1,000 troops over the course of the Syria Study Group's report. And then the tens of thousands of, of forces, both Kurdish and Arab, under the Syrian Democratic Forces. And that one-third of Syria is the resource-rich, it's the economic powerhouse of Syria. So where the hydrocarbons are, which obviously is very much in the public debate here in Washington these days, as well as the agricultural powerhouse. So the United States remains the overall largest single donor of humanitarian aid to Syrians both inside Syria and refugees outside of Syria. And there was some stabilization assistance in the part of Syria that was liberated from ISIS and controlled via the Syrian Democratic Forces in northern and eastern Syria. The rest of Syria, though, is, is rubble. And what the Russians want and what Assad wants is economic reconstruction. Um, and that is something that the United States can basically hold a card on via the international financial institutions and our cooperation with the Europeans. So we argued that absent behavioral changes by the Assad regime, we should hold the line on preventing reconstruction aid and technical expertise from going back into Syria. This is, this is U.S. foreign policy. This is the true nature of U.S. foreign policy. I, I continue. Uh, let me continue with my article. The ongoing conflict in Ukraine today is a result of U.S. regime change in 2014, removing an elected government determined to maintain neutrality and replacing it with a client regime eager to serve as U.S. proxies in war with Russia. The U.S. is also enabling Israel's ongoing war in Gaza, Palestine, and the U.S. is launching missile and airstrikes at targets across Yemen. The foreign affairs op-ed provides a case study in cognitive dissonance. Its authors warn of a future surrendered to an abusive superpower using its military to menace nations worldwide. Acknowledging but never condemning the existing superpower, the United States already demonstrably doing as much. Washington's true fear is not that China is building an international order threatening to subjugate nations worldwide, but is building an international order undermining America's ability to continue coercing and controlling the globe. 
The foreign affairs op-ed then warns, China alone commands an economy meaningfully larger than that of all of its Asian neighbors combined, India included. China's Navy, meanwhile, boasts firepower second only to that of the U.S. Navy, and it is relatively concentrated. Imagine if the entire U.S. naval fleet primarily operated in an arc from New York to New Orleans. That, that is actually very nice to imagine. Yet China was able to achieve all of this since the turn of the century without employing any of the methods of extraterritorial military aggression the U.S. used to achieve its own regional and then global preeminence. By pointing out that China's military power is relatively concentrated, the authors are actually admitting, unlike America's global spanning military presence, China's military is postured solely to defend Chinese territory. Such a military posture could only be perceived as a danger to those seeking to threaten Chinese territory, which includes Taiwan. China's rise across the region is not marked by invasions and networks of military bases, but by high-speed rail lines, ports, power plants, factories, and roadways. Its influence around the globe is not maintained by aircraft carrier strike groups engaged in modern gunboat diplomacy, but by fleets of container ships engaged in international trade. Whereas Washington maintains global preeminence by bombing, China challenges it through building. For example, in Southeast Asia, where China's high-speed rail network extends beyond its own borders, Chinese engineers literally had to disarm unexploded U.S. ordnance dropped on Laos during the Vietnam War before laying tracks finally connecting the impoverished, landlocked country to the rest of the region. Uh, this is a, a literal example of the U.S. bombing and China building. Their, their approach to a specific country, Lao, here in Southeast Asia, just north of Thailand, where I'm based. Quite clearly, China's approach is not similar to that of the U.S., but fundamentally better. So much so, the U.S. is wholly incapable of competing against it. And let me just stop there and remind people that the U.S. has concocted all sorts of public relations stunts, rolling out supposed alternatives to the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, where, where China is building global spanning infrastructure projects, railways, highways, ports, airports. The U.S. had the Blue Dot Network that I'm almost certain nobody remembers. The U.S. also had the Build Back Better framework. This, this was also supposed to be a challenge to China's Belt and Road Initiative. But in reality, the U.S. never even proposed hypothetical infrastructure projects. They, they never went through the trouble of even explaining what things they might build, let alone actually begin building any of these projects. And in reality, what the US does to challenge the Belt and Road Initiative around the globe is it funds opposition groups to go protest against uh, any joint project with China. And then if that doesn't work, they literally arm terrorists to physically blow it up and also attack and kill uh, not just the Chinese engineers working on it, but also the local security trying to protect those engineers. That is how the United States actually is trying to compete against China's much more constructive vision of a, a global future. Let me continue with my article. Toward that end, op-eds like those found in foreign affairs reflecting sentiments widely held across Washington, London, and Brussels strain to make a case for why the world should continue under a US-led international order built on conquest and coercion instead of an alternative international order favored by China built on cooperation and mutual benefit. Because it is an irrational argument to make the use of fear is central in making Washington's case. The irony is, in order to create sufficient fear of what China may do in the future, the authors must tap into what the US has already done. Or in other words, they must accuse China of becoming in fiction what the US has already become in reality. And that is the end of my article. I just wanna point out one other thing. This foreign affairs op-ed, this is how it actually ends. It says, 
Taiwan is, in a sense, the West Berlin of the new Cold War, unfolding between Beijing and the free world. And by free world, they mean the United States and all, all of the nations that it has politically captured. It is an outpost of liberty, prosperity, and democracy living in the shadow of an authoritarian superpower. Just as Stalin tested the free world 76 years ago by blockading Berlin, she, referring to Chinese President Xi Jinping, is now testing it with rising pressure on Taiwan. But I've just explained to you why China is building its military up in response to the, the ongoing situation on Taiwan. The U.S. agrees with Beijing that Taiwan is part of China, and yet they are deliberately, provocatively undermining Chinese sovereignty in, in the worst ways imaginable, acts of war. Back then, U.S. leadership and major investment galvanized a four-decade multinational commitment to keep West Berlin and West Germany free. The stakes are equally stark today with Taiwan, and there is no time left to waste. But when, when you realize the truth, according to even the U.S. State Department itself on its official website, that Taiwan is part of China, that the U.S. officially recognizes Taiwan as part of China, that is the U.S. not only violating agreements it made with Beijing, but it's also violating international law. Uh, is violating the U.N. Charter, which guarantees a nation's sovereignty, its territorial integrity, and its political independence. If we want to compare Taiwan accurately with another uh, place in time and space, I think West Germany is a very poor example. I think it's much more accurate to compare it to Ukraine. The U.S. is putting Taiwan through the exact same process it put Ukraine through, uh, transforming it into a national security threat against one of America's adversaries, Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis Russia, Taiwan vis-a-vis -vis the rest of China. It's actually much worse because Taiwan is, is part of China. And so the U.S. isn't creating a threat right on China's border like the U.S. did with Ukraine on Russia's border. It's actually creating a national security threat within China's internationally recognized borders. We have to ask ourselves, what future do we want to live in? Do we want to continue living in a world where the West maintains primacy over the planet uh, by bombing, by bombing people and nations into submission? Or do we want to try to live in a, a different world where people are allowed to live their lives the way they want within their borders and across borders, people are building and trading and traveling. It sounds much more attractive to me. If it is more attractive to you, uh, please share this information with other people. Let's try to wake up as many people as possible. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing to my channel. It's free to do, it helps the channel grow. Check the video description below for other places you can find it. Follow my work on Telegram. I post absolutely everything, including backups to all of my videos. In the video description below will be all of the links that I referenced in this video, as well as for ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize my YouTube channel or any of my other social media platforms. If ads pop up and you're able to, feel free to skip past them. Uh, otherwise, if you do want to support my work, please do so through Buy Me a Coffee and also Patreon. To everyone who has been helping, whether it's one-time donations or donations month to month, or even if you're just helping share this work with others, that is greatly appreciated. That is what makes this work possible. That is what makes this work impactful. So thank you again, and as always, thank you for watching.